I remember quite vividly watching the Mercury 7 astronauts being selected. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are introducing to you and to the world these seven men who have been selected to begin training for orbital space flight. Followed Alan Shepard's suborbital flight, you know, avidly. My father was an aerospace engineer, so there was a little of that sort of baked into our household. But I got the bug very early on in that. And later on, when my brother would be off doing other things and the family had not wasn't paying quite as much attention to it, I was still tied to the TV set whenever something notable was happening and being televised. Freedom summer is still go. My desires to become an astronaut were from Alan Shepard. I was 12 years old. My family was stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and luckily the flight was a little delayed, so when we got to school, our PE teacher had us all gather around her, listening on a transistor radio, listening to um, Alan Shepard talk to Mission Control, and at that moment I decided I wanted to be an astronaut someday, but it certainly didn't seem like a very realistic goal. My uh, husband was um, a year ahead of me in medical training, and he was a resident, and one of my medical school friends was uh, his intern, and they were having lunch together. Mark told my husband that uh, NASA was looking not only for pilots, but for mission specialists, and the deadline was in about a month. And I can still remember uh, Bill paging me over the hospital paging system and saying, Anna, we had one month, we didn't even think about it or talk about it. You know, and it took about a month to get our applications together back then because you didn't just go online and apply. And so I got my application in like a day before the deadline. Six weeks later, I was in Houston interviewing. And then six months later, you know, found out I was very fortunate to be in that first class of astronauts for the shuttle. I went home for Christmas break I think this would have been Christmas in 1976, I guess. And my brother is the aerospace engineer in the family. He he knew all about it. He'd already filled out his application. And he was encouraging me to put an application in as well. I, honestly, my first thought was that it didn't make any sense. I was on a track to become a deep sea geologist, an oceanographer. Uh, and, you know, it's hard enough to study the ocean through all that water. So going off the earth, being even further away, didn't make initial sense to me. But it happened later on, I guess he planted the seed. And so I noticed a couple of weeks later, back in Nova Scotia, an advertisement by NASA in one of the scientific journals. And when I read that, I realized I had been thinking about it wrong. It wasn't about joining the shuttle program and continue to be an oceanographer. They were basically building a, a research vessel of a very different kind. Uh, and this job would be to help with the planning and the execution uh, of real missions over and over again. Uh, I loved going out to sea. I loved the expeditionary part of the work I was doing. And so when that struck me, I realized this, this could maybe be a really good fit. I think we were all waiting on tender hooks. It was taking a bit longer than any of us really wanted. And for me, the phone rang in the apartment I shared with several other girls at like six or 6.30 in the morning, which you know, never happens. And if it happens, it means probably something bad is happening in, in the family. Uh, and a roommate answered and turned to me down the hallway with this strange look on her face and said, it's for you. It's from NASA <laughs> and handed, handed the phone to me. And it was uh, George Abbey was the senior official involved at the time who got the fun assignment of calling the people who had been selected. And you couldn't miss that whirlwind once it got started. At the time that I was selected, that was what really was sort of amusing to me, asking me all these questions about if I was physically fit, and, you know, how I trained and all that. Well, I don't know if you know a lot about medical training, but <laughs> when you're in medical training, you don't have a lot of time for anything except, you know, working, eating, hopefully a little bit of sleeping. Um, I did work out quite a bit just before I went, uh, you know, for my interviews and everything. But I think really um, when I really started working out, a great deal was after I came to NASA and was selected because um, they really we had our own gym and initially we didn't really have trainers but eventually in the program they realized um, particularly for spacewalks uh, how important that physical training was and uh, we actually had trainers that um, would help us you know decide uh, what we were going to do and what we um, needed to do to be physically fit. 
The mental part, uh, mental preparation, I felt that I was very well prepared from my medical training. I don't think anything, even training to be an astronaut, other than perhaps if you're doing a, a spacewalk, was as hard as my medical training. You know, often you would be up for 36 hours and there's so much material that you have to know. I felt like I was really mentally prepared for that sort of thing because I had done something just as hard or perhaps even harder. The first year of astronaut training when we went through, I would liken to the first year of graduate school in almost every physical science and engineering discipline you can imagine, crammed into hyper intense, maybe six or eight week courses. So just keeping up with the mental pace and the calendar schedule well, really required a lot of stamina. I was selected because of my technical competency and their confidence that I would bring the right skills to a space flight. And you know, that's, that's what I wanted front and center. I, I think we all bristled a little bit at uh, beauty queen kind of lines of questioning coming at us or you know very very sexist you know there always were just men before and they did all the flying and all the spacewalks and all the science so they don't really need you do they aren't you just going to kind of watch uh you know we'd all earned our professional stripes and developed very high levels of competency in our respective fields and we're all very motivated by the purpose and the, the purpose of space missions and the benefits to mankind to our country so we, we didn't want to be pigeonholed into the just girls or you know stereotypically feminine categories to at the expense of our professional recognition i mean famously you know they make a little toiletries kit for the men it's a little spring top box it might have your shaving cream and stuff in it and and they'd made uh, two for women one was really sort of personal hygiene and the other it was you know a makeup kit a cosmetics kit I have no idea who they sought counsel from to do that, but I think that was one instance of imagining, you know, every woman's gonna to want to be very fussy about her hair and makeup. The other famous one, of course, was feminine hygiene. And, you know, the thought of having a woman in space when she might be having her period was this really disconcerting notion to them. They got that one wildly wrong at first. Seeing the Earth from orbit is an extraordinary experience. It really defies words. And, and the, the chance that I might get to do that was really what motivated me to fill out the astronaut application. I was really happy being an oceanographer. And I can tell you, I can tell you exactly when I first saw the Earth from space for the first time, it was precisely eight and a half minutes after we lifted off from Florida. And all the main engines had stopped, we had just reached orbit, and I finally lifted my gaze from the instrument panels on the upper deck of the shuttle and looking over the shoulder of the, my pilot seated in front of me, I had six window view of just panorama of blue and white and the edge of the earth and space beyond. And it literally pulled the breath right out of me. I, I couldn't help myself. I said, wow, look at that. And of course that was not a great moment to say, wow, look at that because we still had a lot of things to do in the checklist, but it just bursts out of you. It's an extraordinary moment. You suddenly are incredibly aware of how small you and all the little things of your everyday life, how really small and insignificant they are. And I think I think every astronaut says, can we take everybody up there and let them experience it? Yes, for the beauty, but also because the way I think it would transform our sense of who we are living on this planet. We're all in this together. We're on this spaceship together. We have to begin to work together as a crew and, and move past the sometimes very small differences that lead us to compete or, or fight with each other. And the more opportunity you get, I mean, Anna and I both had opportunity to fly you know, dozens or a couple hundred orbits around the Earth. It just keeps getting more nuanced and refined and, and somehow even more precious than that first glimpse. Yes, I remember my first view of looking at the Earth and it's just, you know, words are really just inadequate. <laughs> you, you do your best to try to describe how beautiful it is, but it's just amazing and it's constantly changing, you know, the clouds, the weather, and then you look out into the vast blackness of space and you realize that other than this beautiful planet, there's nothing that we're going to be able to live on, uh, certainly for quite a long time in the future. It really makes you start to feel a little bit like we're all astronauts on this planet Earth 
and um, it really makes you sad when you look into uh, various parts of the world like the Middle East or now Ukraine and it makes you sad that you know we can't all appreciate it and take better care of the earth and each other. I think the six of us, you know, we, we became astronauts if you listen to each of our stories because that's what we wanted to do. It was not to be a role model or to set a precedent. It was just because we were following our own path and our own dreams. You wanted to do a good job because you wanted to do a good job. Right. But you also uh, took into account the fact that other women would come after you and you didn't want anyone to be able to point to any one of us and say, well, see, so-and-so didn't do it. When I finally uh, told people I was pregnant, it was really interesting. I was getting to be in my mid-30s when our group was starting to be assigned. And I just, uh, my husband and I decided, you know, we just probably, you know, both of us being doctors, we understood, you know, that the older you got, the less likely it would be. So uh, we just decided to make that commitment. And um, the way I dealt with it initially was I didn't tell anyone until it was like so obvious that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that I had to tell people that I was pregnant. And then very shortly after that, our boss, George Abbey, called me into his office and said he wanted to assign me to a flight. And I'll have to admit, I was really surprised. <laughs> I wasn't really expecting that, but I wasn't about to say no. Um, so uh, Kristen was born on a Friday morning and I was at the Monday morning pilots meeting just to be sure that everyone knew that although I just had a baby, I definitely was going to be on that flight. It was probably one of the most uh, intense years of, of my life, you know, being a new mom on one hand and then training for your own flight. I remember carrying Kristen in her little carrying thing to the simulator at night when I was trying to work out some of the robotic procedures. Leaving her was probably the hardest thing that I ever did. But I don't think it's that different really than anybody who has a career that involves risk. You know, the longest we were separated was 14 or 15 days. But we did a lot of videoing because, you know, of course we knew that there was risk and all that sort of thing. And if anything happened, I, I really wanted Kristen to at least remember me and, and get to see us interacting uh, when she could watch that later. And in retrospect, I'm kind of proud that my boss felt that I could handle that, you know, having a new baby and also going into space. And I think now it's become a lot more routine. There have been many women who've flown in space and, and gone on to do expeditions on the space station. But it does make me feel good when I hear Kristen doing an interview now and she says, you know, it never occurred to me that I couldn't have a demanding job and be a, a parent because my mom did it. And so uh, if that helps other women, um, that that's I feel good about it, but there was so much more pressure just by doing your job and wanting to do a good job and worrying if Kristen would be well taken care of, if anything happened to me. Those pressures were far greater than the pressure of being the first mom because that was just a coincidence of when I was assigned.